Hello everyone and welcome back to another video and remember how I said in the Z170X SoC 4-LN2 uh, video that I would really like to have a 2DIM motherboard for my test bench well now I have one um, d like literally just like one or two days after making that video I found this Maximus 9 Apex for sale on eBay for really cheap like 50 euros and it came with a CPU for free. That CPU is probably already worth the 50 euros um, or like a large part of it. So essentially the board is free. And right now you probably have heard the uh, uh, person uh, going on the motorcycle next to my uh, house. So basically it's really hot today. Uh, that's my ambient temperature right now. And uh, I just have all my windows open and all my fans running because otherwise I'm going to melt right here. Um, so, sorry, the, you're gonna hear a lot of cars because I live next to a very busy street. You might even hear uh, an ambulance or two. So, uh, I can't really do anything about that. Um, it, it is just really hot today. <laughs> anyway, so, I found this board for effectively free. Like, I can just sell the CPU because the CPU is like a seller on G3900. Um, can probably recoup most of the cost that I paid for this motherboard, so it's effectively free. Like, it, in the end, I probably pay as much as for, like, getting a kebab or something. Um, so yeah, um, I'm really happy to get this board, and I didn't just get the board. It came with basically all the accessories and the original box, like, really, really good condition. Uh, even on, on, the, on the chipset here, you can kind of see it, it even still has the peel on it. And also on, on this little thing that uh, was here, this also still has the peel on it. Like, this thing was basically unused. Also, like, really clean. Like, I didn't have to dust this off or anything. Like, really, really extremely good condition. Even better than the Z170. <laughs> um, meaning the uh, SOC LN2. So, yeah, really happy to get this board. And... Now I just realized I have I have put away the manual. Uh, we're gonna have to get that once we get into the uh, all the buttons on this board because just like the SOC fours, uh, yeah, it's an extreme overclocking board and it has a lot of buttons. But let's first get into the stuff that I don't need the manual for. Beginning of course with the dot one dim per channel memory config. So it's a two dimmer motherboard which usually is reserved for ITX motherboards, but um, you see some extreme overclocking boards. And basically all the extreme overclocking boards. There's few other boards that can call themselves extreme overclocking capable that don't do this. Um, so you only have one dim slot per memory channel on this board. And that is uh, an important thing. Because, first off, removing the two unneeded slots makes you enables you to put the right slot closer to the CPU than it would have been with four slots, reducing latency and increasing signal integrity which makes overclocking in the second slot better. And just not having those extra slots there removes all the extra traces and the extra like socket pins that are in the socket that would have been still there even if you don't use the slot. Those use interference. They're gone now, so that interference no longer exists. So that's why having um, one DIMM per channel is better. Because like most people don't use more than two RAM sticks anyway, um, so you might as well do this and for extreme overclocking well you do that if you want to run like high frequency get a dual rank uh, dim so yeah then for the VRM let's get out of this right away so this is the VRM heatsink uh, it looks nice it's not really that great at being a heatsink because there's literally no fins on this like it's probably good enough to absorb all the heat but like yeah it's just a hunk of metal not really that great as a heatsink so, the V-Core VRM um, is an 8-phase and the, um, the AMOS components that it uses is the CSD87350. Um, now this is a, I think Texas Instruments describes it as like a power pack. Essentially it's just their proprietary standard of dual NFET and they rate each of these for 40 amps. So effectively the V-Core VRM on this is just as strong as on the Z170 SoC Force LN2, because that's also an 8-phase, uh, an also on 40 amp, but that one's on power stages, because that one uses IR3553s. This one's on dual NFETs. Um, but 
still 40 amps uh, per component, 8 phase. Um, in other words, completely fine uh, for my 8700K. And yes, the CPU runs in this. Yes, it's not a Z370, not a Z390. We'll get into that uh, because, you, well, most people are probably aware that you can mod Z170 and Z270 boards into running Coffee Lake CPUs, and yeah, I've done it. Um, but we'll get into that later. So, VCOVM is an 8 phase, and then you have, I think those should be two extra phases for iGPU. Let's just take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, then plus 2 for your iGPU. Same components. And all that should be controlled by this controller right here, which, uh, yeah, it's an ASP 14 something. Uh, yeah, 14051. Or is it a one, 14051? Am I, am I reading this correctly? Like, it's a rebranded something controller. I, I, I don't exactly know what it is. Um, you might be able to look it up. Yeah, I don't even know who makes this. Um, this should, like this, actually, is this a true 8? No, I think I've read, um, I think I've read that this is actually a doubled 4. Because, like, we have a doubler here, a doubler there, another double there, and a doubler there. Uh, on the back, well, we have one chip for each of these MOS uh, dual end fits. That's probably the driver then, because these don't have integrated drivers, otherwise, there would be the AMOSs. But since we. Oh my god, yes. That person was compensating for something. Um. Yeah, but we don't have one of these chips for the two iGPU phases, so I assume these are doublers because I did like Hardware Lux has a VRM list for like basically all the Z170 to Z390 boards and also some of the newer ones, and they do list the Apex as a 4x2 for vCore. So these are probably the doublers. Uh, those are very small chips. I have no idea what that is. Oh, it's an IR something. Uh, that's probably an IR3598 then. So this is probably an IR controller too. It might be the very same one that we have on the uh, on the Z170 SoC4 Zilin 2. That would be an IR35201, if I remember correctly. So maybe that's this thing. Maybe that's this controller then. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually I think it's a 35201. Anyway, so that's the VCore VRM. Like, not really that special if you compare it to like what an Apex comes with these days. Um, but in the, like, for an 8700K, this is fine. For 1900K, mm, it might get a bit hot. I still think it would be fine. Um, but a better VRM for 1900K, if you want to use a uh, Sakai Lake or KB Lake motherboard, would probably be the Z170 OC formula. Because um, that has the same components. It's also on CSD 87350s but it has 12 of them instead of 8. So, yeah, uh, 1900K will run on the OC formula much better than on this. Though I still think this would be fine for 1900K. Then, um, I need to talk about this gimmick. So we have two 8-pin um, EPS power plugs on this thing. Uh, you can pretty much ignore the second one. I like. So this board was made for the 6700K and the 7700K. Both of these are 4-core 8-thread CPUs. They're not going to use more than the 8-pin, than one of them. Now, after this board was made, it was discovered that you can run 8700K and 1900K in this. And 8700K should still not max out this 8-pin, or like it shouldn't need more than a single 8-pin. Uh, and 1900K, yeah, okay, that one can be a bit power-hungry. I still think a 1900K would only need like a 8 plus 4 though. I don't think a 1900K would actually need an 8 plus 8. But anyway, you have it, like not having it and not needing it is better than not having it and needing it. It's just that uh, it's kind of a gimmick and you shouldn't worry about it if your power supply only has one plug for EPS. Which, for example, my power supply only has one 8-pin EPS, so just ignore the second one. Then, rear I.O. Um, we have this button. Very, very important for modding it for um, Coffee Lake. Uh, here we have a cl CMOS clear button. 
Um, this is, works pretty much the exact same way how the CMOS clear button works on the uh, Maximus 2, no, it's a Rampage 2 gene. Um, effectively what this does, if your system like hangs or doesn't post or whatever, you press this, it instantly turns the system off, if it isn't off already, and clears the CMOS. So you can boot right up and you go like into default settings. Now this is the BIOS flashback button. Um, if you put a USB stick specifically into this USB slot right here, um, uh, yeah, it needs to be a FAT32 um, um, formatted USB stick. You cannot use an NTFS uh, one. It needs to be a FAT32. You can put your BIOS file for the motherboard on this. And if you press this button for three seconds, it will then start blinking and uh, it will start flashing the BIOS that's on the USB stick. You need to give it a specific name. I think M9A.cap. For the official ones, for the unofficial ones, you need to use a different name. I'll get go into that later. Um, but you can flash your BIOS that way without having a CPU, or in case like you break your BIOS, you can recover your BIOS that way. Um, this board also has dual BIOS. Um, you could also theoretically recover corrupt BIOS that way. Um, but this button is very, very, very convenient for flashing coffee leg -like BIOSes onto this. Then we have two PSU2 ports. Now, on some, on actually quite a lot of motherboards these days, you still see one combo PS, uh, PS2 port. This one has two separate ones for keyboard and mouse, specifically because it's an extreme overclocking board, and there's benchmarks, for example, SuperPi. Um, now, SuperPi is a CPU benchmark, and it works best on Windows XP, but Windows XP doesn't have any USB drivers, so you cannot use USB mice and keyboards you need to use PS2 ones. So that's what this is for, so that you can use a PS2 mouse and keyboard on Windows XP without having to find a way. I don't even know if you can make the USB ports work, but in case you have to, it's not gonna be easy. So you just have this. Then we have a display port and an HDMI for iGPU. Like, I mean, iGPU overclocking is probably quite interesting on this because of the RAM. Like, iGPU overclocking I've heard is really fun if you like, to tune in, if you like tuning RAM. So, yeah. Then we have six USB 3.0 uh, USB ports, another that's probably 3.1, a Type-C, LAN port, standard audio, and that's it for the uh, rear I.O. Um, going on to the PCI Express slots, this has the same PCI Express slot spacing as we've seen on the Z170 SOC LN2. Um, so this has a setup where you can run SLI and Crossfire. Sadly, SLI only two-way, at least officially. Uh, with different SLI Auto, you should probably be able to actually run 4-way on this. I'm not sure about that, though. Um, but as far as it goes, SLI officially always needs at least a PCI Express 8x connection, and it only works in these two slots. This is a 16x, this is an 8x. Um, and if you like, if you have one in this slot, it, oh, this one's also turned. Like, this is a 16x, but it can be split into 8x, and then the other 8x goes here. And this can even be split another once more, then this turns into a 4x, and it, I think it goes here to this one. Not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, this one and this one are only 4x, even though, interestingly enough, they do have the pins for 8 lanes. Like, you can see how, how they have the exact same amount of pins as the 8x slot, but they are only labeled as 4x on the motherboard. Whereas this one's labeled as 8x, 4x, and this one's labeled 16x, 8x. So, yeah. Uh, so officially only two-way SLI, but Crossfire is gonna work four-way, because Crossfire runs on 4x. Like Crossfire, work, I don't know, it might even run on 1x. I think Crossfire just straight up doesn't have PCI Express lane requirement. Um, so you can run four uh, cards on this in Crossfire, only two in SLI officially. You might be able to work your way around that. Then, down here, uh, we get into our first uh, extreme overclocking-esque uh, thing, because here we have a BIOS switch, um, because the board has dual BIOS. So you press this, actually I don't know if you might have to hold it, because there's an LED indicator for which BIOS you use, and when I pressed it just once, it didn't change. Um, but yeah, somehow you can uh, change over to dual BIOS on this. Um, yeah, so it, it has dual BIOS, and that's the switch for it. Then uh, front, we have a couple front I.O. things, a couple of fan things. Here you have a couple jumpers where you can turn on and off some of the RGB of them on the motherboard. So if you just don't want RGB, you can just 
set those uh, jumpers into the other position and the RGB will turn off. So yeah, I guess cool for people that don't like Rainbow Puke because they're not installing Aura Sync on a test bench. Then we have two SATA, uh, four SATAs uh, and right angle uh, USB 3.0 and a Molex. So the Molex connector works in the same way as the 6-pin does on the Z170 uh, SOC4s, uh, LN2, I always say a different name, slightly different, anyway. Um, so this adds extra power to your PCI Express slots because in your 24-pin there's only two 12-volt cables. So these are usually 18-gauge, two 18-gauge 12-volt uh, cables, not really that great at, at carrying 300 watts of 12 volt power because that's how much you could by spec draw from these um, if you have four way crossfire setup every card is specced for 75 watts from the PCI Express slot so that's 300 watts that you're drawing through two little connections only one if you have a 20 pin plugged in so this is what this is for you plug the small legs in and you take some load off of the 24 pin so that uh, you don't overload those cables in there then we have a MEM OK button, and this is the point where I need to get the manual because I'm not entirely sure what it does. So excuse me real quick. And here we have the manual. Good thing I got this. Um, yeah. So uh, at some point it starts describing the onboard buttons. Here we go. Let's just go through the buttons as it says, so that there's a button here, there's a couple more buttons here. Let's just go through all of them as the menu says and then go over whatever it leaves out. So start button, yeah, you have a power on button. You don't need to wire up your front I.O. Same for reset button. Just, yeah, fairly standard feature. Now the memo K button, so this button again. Let's just read what it does. Uh, installing dims that are not compatible with this motherboard may cause system boot failure and the DRAM LED lights continuously. Press and hold the MEM OK button until the DRAM LED starts blinking to begin automatic memory comp compatibility tuning for successful boot. So, yeah. So it, it can help with incompatib incompatibility issues, which in the early days of DDR4 did exist. I don't actually know, like Z170 boards are usually tuned for the A0 PCB of DDR4, which is like all the very, very old DDR4. I don't know about Z270. Um, it hopefully is tuned for uh, A2, because all my memory sticks are A2, and A2 is better because A0 was at like something really low. Um, so, yeah. But basically, if. Like, well, you could get like a 4800 XMP kit, that probably doesn't run on, on, on this board, even though it is a 2 dimmer. You press this, and then the board just like tries to make it work. Um, and this probably also works, uh, like it doesn't specifically say it in the manual, but if you like dial in some very uh, some very crazy settings, like some something um, that's quite hard to run, and it doesn't post the first time, I guess you can press this and the bot will just try to make that work too. So then, um, save boot button. So save boot, that is the, that is the red one. The save boot button can be pressed any time to force the system to reboot into the save, uh, BIOS save mode. This button temporarily applies save settings to the BIOS while retaining any overclocked settings, allowing you to modify the settings causing boot failure. Use this button when overclocking or tweaking the settings of your system. So, yeah, this uh, is one of the very cool buttons that extreme overclocking boards have. So basically, if you have some very aggressive settings that don't post, and they don't just post the first time, and this doesn't work, they just don't post at all, you can press this button. Your board will apply like basically default settings, I suppose. So you can boot into BIOS, but it won't delete any of your settings that you made. You will still have all the settings you applied before it wouldn't, didn't want to post. So you get to keep all your settings, but you get to post and get into BIOS and, and fix whatever made the board not post. Then, uh, slow mode switch. Uh, slow mode switch is employed during LN2 benching. The system may crash due to CPU being unstable when using extreme overclocking. Enabling slow mode will decrease the processor frequency and stabilize the system, allowing overclockers to keep track of their overclocking data. So, slow mode, that is the button on top here. So this is uh, an 
basically the same we that we saw on the SOCL and two as well. Um, basically, you switch this on, your CPU goes to a very low clock. So if like you're doing super pi, and you're really pushing the frequency, and your super pi just finished, and you just need to take a screenshot now, you can turn this on. Your CPU will no longer be at the crazy high frequency, so you can take your screenshot in peace without having to like risk that it might crash while taking the screenshot, because you're uh, so like pushing frequency so hard. Um, PCIe 16x lane switch, so... Yeah. So this is also the same we saw on the SOCLN2. Uh, it's this thing right here. You can disable the PCI Express slots. So, same usage as on the SOC. If you have, like, uh, an SLI setup and one of the car like one of the cards causes the system to not be able to post and you want to find out which one so you just disable one after the other until the system boots and then you know oh it's this card and this one might have to be reseated or like troubleshot uh, a bit more or just if you have like a, if you have an uh, SLI setup and you're done getting all your scores for SLI but you want to get some single card scores as well you can just disable the second card and just push the first card without having to change anything about the setup so yeah. Then, uh, BIOS switch button. Oh, we already have that. Motherboard comes with two BIOS chips. Press the BIOS button to switch BIOS and load different BIOS settings. The nearby BIOS LEDs indicate the current selected BIOS. Yeah. Doesn't say if you have to hold it. Just pressing it shortly didn't really do anything for me. So, maybe I was probably doing something wrong. So, retry button. That's uh, probably the white one. Yep. Um, the retry button is especially especially designed for overclockers and is most useful during the booting process where the rest where the reset button is rendered useless. When pressed, it forces the system to reboot by retaining the game the same settings to be retried in quick succession to achieve successful posts. So I guess this is a more hardcore version of the memo K button. So like if you have settings that don't wanna post and the board just keeps going like, oh you, you failed like to post five times in a row, you wanna go back to stock settings and you just say no, no keep trying to boot the settings. You would just just mash mash the retry button. It should, we would just retry to run the settings you put in until it works, or either you get bored of pressing the button. Then, pause switch. The pause switch allows you to freeze the cooling, uh, the cooling system at hardware level, thus allowing you to adjust your system settings under heavy overclocking. I don't entirely understand what that means. Uh... Yeah, I don't know what that means. Does it like just freeze the system? Like, does it just halt all the clocks? Or what does it mean with the cooling system? I... I actually don't know what this pause switch does. Like, maybe it just halts the system, like maybe it just stops any calculations. And then if you turn it off, it just continues. So you can like basically remount your CPU port or something while the system's turned on. Um, it might be something completely different. I, I don't really get the description. So then, uh, RSVD switch. This switch is reserved for ASUS authorized technicians only. Okay. <laughs> so, um, not a very good uh, description, but basically I so I saw Buildsoid's video, how he went over this board, and how he described it, this is basically a cold boot bug fix switch. So, this is supposed to, so, this one down here, this is supposed to like load some special source BIOS settings that are supposed to make your CPUs boot correctly. Um, if you like, uh. <coughs> sorry. Yeah. One problem with having the windows open is that the air gets very that the air gets very dry. Um, but yeah, like you turn this on, and it will hopefully make your CPU boot at like very cold temperatures if you run into a cold boot bug. Then onboard LEDs, well, it's just the debug LEDs. <coughs> wow. And the ass drive. <sighs> oh, it has condensation detection LEDs, that's cool. That's these ones. So if the board detects condensation at like CPU, RAM, or PCIe slot, it will turn these on. So if you like... Yeah, I've had it a couple of times that I got like moisture into the PCIe slot and it made cards crash when I was uh, doing sub-zero overclocking. So... This will be cool. Um, maybe this, this one will tell you, hey, your PCI Express slot is like frozen through. Maybe you like to try again later. <laughs> then of course we have the postcode and that's it. 
So is there anything that left out? Um, yeah, a little bit. So, um, just like on the Z170 SOC4 Zen 2, we also have some voltage measurements with uh, things here. I don't know if it's the same number. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it should be the exact same amount of voltage because, like, the SOC had like five in one place and then four in another. This is, yeah, this is five plus four. So these could be the exact same uh, voltage measurement points as on the uh, SOC. Just that you just get a solder vo solder blob here. You don't get like any. Uh, fancy probes to plug into, um, you just have to solder something on yourself. But I guess it's still there. Um, then you also get some jumpers that say DRAM channel B1, DRAM channel A1. So these might disable, yeah I think these disable your RAM slot, so if um, yeah also again like a similar idea like the PCI Express slots if like one of your RAM channels is making problems and you want to find out which, you just disable until it works again and then you know, oh the one I just disabled is the one that makes problems. But also the same like, oh I want to go for like maximum RAM frequency and I want to find out which, which slot is the best so you just keep testing and then you can just disable uh, the worst slot. So I guess the outer slot should be the worst one because it is farther away from the CPU. So you can just disable that and then push the frequency on the one remaining slot. Um, and then... Yeah, so like pretty much the last thing would be this. This right here, I, I don't know what it is, but I'm pretty sure I know what it is because it's right next to the PWM controller. This is probably an I2C hookup point, so you can connect your Elma EVC to this and control the what's probably an IR35201 over the EVC. So you can like on the fly change uh, voltage settings, switching frequency, whatever it supports. Uh, you don't have to go into BIOS for that. And you can do it while the system's posted. So that's cool I guess. Now, how much time have we actually wasted? 27 minutes only. I'm doing fast today. So, let's get into how I managed to run my 8700K in this Z270 motherboard. So, um, this mod is actually quite well known. Like, there's literally a HWBot forums post about how to specifically make 8700Ks work in specifically Maximus 9 Apexes. I haven't used that exact mod, um, but all the hardware mods I got directly from there. So, uh, Lumi also has a video about how to make that work. Um, which is also, yeah, good to know because he explains why the hardware work, uh, why the hardware mods work the way they do. So basically, um, when Intel went from Z270 to Z370, they changed which pin in the socket is the socket occupied pin, and this pin, when it's being pulled low, as far as I understand, it needs to be pulled low, so pulled to ground, and when that happens, the Super I/O chip over here detects that. And then when you press your power button, it turns on. If you press a power button and the Super IO chip sees that the socket occupied pin is not pulled low, then it won't start your motherboard, like won't start your system because it goes, oh, there's no CPU in the socket, even though there is a CPU in the socket, but it's a CPU where the socket occupied pin is on a different pad or pin in the socket. Um, and they literally moved it one to the left as far as I'm aware. <laughs> Like, not just one position. So that that's, that's just, like, it's quite obvious malice on Intel's side because they knew people were gonna try this and they tried to do it that way, but we found other ways. So, the way how you can do this, there's two ways. Either you mod your CPU itself, just short the pins, the, like, the pads together, the pad where it is on the old CPUs and where it is on the new ones, just short those together, because one's a ground pad, apparently. Or you can just mod your motherboard, then you don't need to mod the CPUs you put into it. And then you go to the Super I.O. chip, and on the Maximus 9 Apex specifically, you solder wire uh, to these two points. So, yeah, I, I just saw this on the, um, on the HWBot article about this. And yeah, so basically the Super I.O. chip, you just 
find the uh, output, like you, you see which chip you have. So that's a Nuvoton NCT six seven nine three D. You look up the data sheet for that. Look the uh, look up the out pin output. Then you find the SKT OCC pin. I think it's called like the socket occupied pin. Uh, and then I guess the other pad is ground. So yeah, Lumi e explains it a bit more in, in detail. So, so look up his video. Um, so yeah, you need to do that because then the socket occupied pin is pulled low and then the motherboard will start with a Coffee Lake CPU installed into it. But you still need to mod the BIOS because the BIOS was obviously not made to support 8700K, 9900K or the other Coffee Lake CPUs. Um, so you still need to to mod the BIOS on this, which is how, when we come, how we come back uh, to the BIOS flashback. But first, there needs to be done another hardware mod. So on the Maximus 9 Apex, there's two pads here. You can't really see it that well. But you also need to short those together. Um, when these two pads are shorted together, you will be able to, f to flash non-official BIOSes using BIOS flashback. And it only works if this is uh, shorted together. Um, now, I don't know if you need to do this on every board. You need to do this on the Apex. You need to do it on the Formula. Um, for other boards, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, j just look up Lumi's video on how to do it. He also shows it how, how to do it on like a uh, like an ASRock board. But yeah, so on, on the Apex, you need to short those two pads. Then you will be able to just use BIOS Flashback to flash an unofficial BIOS. So then you go to BIOS Flashback, you plug a USB into this port. Um, but instead of naming it m9a.cap, you need to, um, like first you need to get a custom BIOS file. Um, WinRaid made a tool for just converting a BIOS file into a modded one that supports Coffee Lake, or you can just download a BIOS file that's already pre-modded. Now on the HW bot side, they did have a pre-modded BIOS file that I tried. I plugged this in, and you need to rename it to creative.rom. Plug this in, once the pads are shorted, you hold this for a few seconds, then it will start blinking, and uh, once it's done, it turns off. And then, it will just work. Um, however, there's a few issues. So the BIOS that was linked on the HWBot site did work, did fire up, but hyper-threading wasn't working. So my 8700K only had six cores, six threads. It didn't have hyper-threading. Now that's a known issue. The, the HWBot article even says that Hyperthreading seems to be broken, specifically on the 6-core CPUs. On the 1900K, apparently it still worked, and on like, all the old CPUs also still worked, apparently. Um, but on the 8700K, it didn't. Um, now, there's apparently also multiple ways to fix that. You can just manually, like, PEX edit some stuff in the BIOS, or you just do what I did, and uh, get the Maximus 10 Apex BIOS, and flash, his, flash it onto this Maximus 9 Apex BIOS. So, of course, that's also a modded one, and um, I did get it sent by someone. So, basically, on that same HWBot article, if you scroll down a little bit on, like, the second page or something, um, someone posted a modified Maximus 10 Apex BIOS that you can just flash on this one, which then has hyperthreading support. Now, why this works is because the Maximus 10 Apex is essentially the exact same board, just with a the 1151v2 socket on it, and like Z370 instead of Z270. But like, the P M PCB base layout, the VRM, like, the same. Um, so the Maximus 10 Apex and the Maximus 9 Apex are like, basically as similar as they can be. Um, which is why you can just kind of like, flash the Maximus 10 BIOS onto this. And that's exactly what I did. I used that BIOS, but only after it was sent to me, because the link on the HWBot site is actually broken, um, so I had to ask around on Discord and uh, it ended up, uh, I, I got the link sent. So you might have to ask around to find that file. Or maybe it's somewhere else. Or maybe you need to use like the WinRaid tool to create your own BIOS. I didn't try that. Um, but yeah, so I, I just got the uh, modified Maximus 10 Apex BIOS. It even says Maximus 10 Apex in the BIOS now. Uh, cool, so like it actually thinks it's a Coffee Lake motherboard. Um, but yeah, so that's how I had hyperthreading working now uh, with that modified Maximus 10 BIOS. Some people on that HWBot article also said that uh, the three top PCI Express slots stopped working, only the bottom one works. Now for me, they always worked with both the BIOSes, 
Um, but uh, yeah, if, if these don't work, that's apparently also a wider known issue and you should probably just test a different BIOS and see if it works. And yeah, so I think that's actually kind of about it. Um, yeah, I think I've said everything I wanted to say. The only thing I haven't shown it is like, well, yeah, this is the Dim.2 because there's no M.2 slots on this. So Asus turned two M.2 slots into like this weird dim thing where I have my boot drive and you can like add it like this. Like, the I really don't like Asus's weird RAM slots where only there's only this thing on one side and then this weird thing on the other side. I it feels super weird to plug things into this and take them out. It feels like you're doing you're breaking something. I really don't like those. But yeah, uh, yeah, you get your M.2 slots that way, and then of course your two RAM slots. I yeah, my my usual test bench kit. It's just some Hynix CJR. Honestly, this motherboard deserves B-Die. Um, but I don't have any B-Die for my test bench right now. Um, so, yeah. It's just gonna be CJR for now. Um, but yeah. Probably should still clock better than on my other boards. Cause like my Z390 board doesn't run one... Uh, sorry, door rang. Uh, someone came to pick up their package. The, the DHL guy usually leaves a lot of packages with me. <laughs> Cause I'm apparently home the most. Even though I'm like at uni every day. Anyway, um, yeah, it's just gonna be the CJR for now. Like, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm still gonna have fun with the board, hopefully, like it's a proper overclocking board, finally, I'm gonna have a proper overclocking board for my test bench, um, and yeah, it should do, obviously, do better memory clock, unless it's optimized for A0, that would be bad, because all my RAMs are in A2, as I said, uh, gonna be problematic. I hope the Z270 is... Well, it has a Maximus 10 BIOS. Like, memory tuning is also a lot of BIOS stuff. So I guess it's gonna have pretty good compatibility now, because the Maximus 10 BIOS is like... That's A2. That should be A2. Um, and I mean, the PCB is almost the same, so... Like, they might have changed something about the memory topology. Um... But since they kept the base PCB, like the base layout the same, I, I hope it's gonna be kinda similar and it's gonna clock A2 fine. Um, yeah. And that would be it. So I I, I like the board hardware-wise. Um, it's my first time using a modern Asus board. I've used several older Asus boards. It's still have like the gray blue BIOS. Um, but this is the first Asus board with like a full UEFI BIOS uh, that I'm using and from my first couple impressions I don't really like it. I, I, I don't really like the Asus BIOS. It just kind of looks like there's too much stuff without order just kind of thrown in there. And then of course they have their weird names for their memory settings like, you know, like why use the standard naming for memory settings if you can just come up with their own ones. Um, at least they put like a little hint down there what's usually the standard name for the timing, so I guess that's fine um, But yeah, like I knew go I knew that going into it. I, I, I know Asus BIOS is uh, special um, And I guess I'm gonna learn it over time It's just that uh, When it comes to BIOSes, I think MSI BIOS and the new Gigabyte BIOS. The new Gigabyte BIOS is quite decent. The old Gigabyte BIOS is probably on the level of this one um, but right now the, the MSI BIOS and the new Gigabyte BIOS is probably the ones that are like the easiest to work with. Um, but yeah. So I don't want to really stretch the video out any longer now. Got a new test bench motherboard for effectively free because I can just sell the CPU and basically have the motherboard for free. Really good condition, pretty much all the accessories, like even the AO shield was still, like it's still sealed in the box. So whoever had this thing before me was definitely also an overclocker. Or straight up didn't use the board. Um, yeah. So. That would be it. Uh, so thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you maybe learned something about extreme overclocking motherboards. Um, and yeah. So until next time. Goodbye.